Do you want to increase your knowledge of the local river systems in the DMV area? Well, Jake's Bait and Tackle has you covered. Saturday, December 17th, starting at 2 p.m., they are hosting a River Guides panel. That's right, a River Guides panel, where we'll have guides that will cover the Susquehanna River, the Upper Potomac, and the Shenandoah River. The Susquehanna River will be handled by Chris Gorsuch of Real River Adventures. Jeff Green of Shallow Water Adventures will talk about the Upper Potomac, and the Shenandoah River will be covered by Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Services. This is a phenomenal time to ask your questions on how to become a better river fisherman. If you can't make it, don't worry, because Fishing the DMV has you covered. We'll be trying to live stream the whole event to be able to take your questions. Again, that's December 17th at 2 p.m. See you there. Hey, everyone. We are doing a special giveaway to celebrate our one-year anniversary of the podcast. That's right. Fishing the DMV is one year old. It's pretty exciting. And to celebrate the occasion, we're giving away a fishing trip with Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Services. He operates out of the Shenandoah River and the Upper Potomac River. And we're giving you four unique ways that you can try to win an opportunity to fish with him. Number one, all online orders with Jake's Bait and Tackle. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle website, whatever you order, in the comments section of your order, just put the hashtag fishing the DMV and you enter a chance to win. Number two, all orders in person. Just go to the store and say you'd like to enter the contest. Again, hashtag fishing the DMV. That's two ways. Number three, if you don't have any money, if you're one of my younger audience, because I know I have a lot of kids that listen to the podcast, I'm giving you two ways that you can do it that's absolutely free. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review of Fishing the DMV podcast. And at the end of your review, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV and you had a chance to win. Now, I'm going to give you a fourth way that you can enter the competition. On every video that drops from November 15th to December 15th, every new video that, that's on the channel, in the comments section, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV. Now, here's a caveat. It's every video. So if you miss one video, I'm not going to be able to count you but it's free. All you got to do is in every new video from November 15th to December 15th in the comment section, just leave the hashtag fishing the DMV and you have a chance to win. So four ways, if you want to make an order online and leave the hashtag fishing the DMV, go to Jake's bait and tackle in person and tell them hashtag fishing the DMV. Number three, leave a review of the podcast on Apple podcast with the hashtag fishing the DMV. And number four on every new video that drops from December I'm sorry, from November 15th to December 15th, leave the hashtag fishing the DMV in the comment section, and that gives you four unique opportunities to win. The contest winner will be announced Saturday, December 17th at Jake's Bait and Tackle's All Day Christmas Seminar Bash. Again, contest winner will be announced December 17th, that Saturday, at Jake's Bait and Tackle's Christmas Seminar Bash. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. And we are live, everybody. Fantastic. So we are joined with Chris McCotter, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, the, I don't know, I would call him the, the, the outdoor business empire of Virginia with uh, the Lake Anna Guide Services, Woods and Water Magazine. Um, and then I think we'll just get right into it. And then you're also getting you're going digital right you're gonna be the next uh joe rogan mr beast scott martin what, what do you got going on in the digital front yeah no definitely not uh joe rogan gonna probably uh <laughs> stay away from that that type of approach but uh i scott martin seems to be a good guy but uh as my son tells me my 20 year old son tells me so first of all i want to thank you guys for inviting me back to fishing the dmv i love being with you thomas as well as Jared, it's an honor to be speaking with you both. You're hardworking guys, and I know that you know this is a passion for you, and uh, what I'm doing is a passion for me. So I'm glad we can collaborate and share that passion. So again, thank you for having me tonight. Good deal, sir. No, it's all as you always as, have an open door. All right. Well, as far as as where Woods and Waters is going, um, you know, we asked ourselves at 35 years strong, where are we going? You know, we want to make sure we have a plan. And that plan is to expand our platform so that it's full. And that would be to enhance our social media with Instagram, a better website, as well as the YouTube channel and 
who knows what else. But at, at this point, we've, we've hired a digital content manager, Nick Zanheiser, young man, 24 years old. And uh, I, loved, uh, I loved to see the, the energy and young people, because I remember at one point when I started out, I was 24 as well. So I, um, I work really well with him. And Nick has gotten our website um, with the help of a company called All Bits On ready to go. Um, hopefully we will launch, uh, in about four days and let's see today is, if I'm not, correct me if I'm not right, is it the September 3rd? <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're getting there. there. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> very soon we'll have a new woods and waters magazine.com that is more of a WordPress blog type of site. So everything you see in the magazine, you'll be able to see, uh, on that site, as well as the entire magazine in a flip book format. So when you say digital, yeah, we'll be digital and you can take an article and you know, drop it into any kind of Facebook post you want, or you can, you know, share that link with your friend on email. Uh, we're doing that. And then uh, we're working on YouTube one, which would be our first YouTube video, which is very important to make sure that everybody understands you know, what Woods and Waters is going to do with their YouTube channel. And it's called Woods and Waters Adventures. Oh, cool. So, yeah, we'll, we're, we're not quite ready to announce the, the drop of that, but it's coming. We're, we're, we're working on it. We got a lot of great footage at the Green Top um, Expo this past weekend. So, And I it's noticed, no too, you, you put out a uh, little uh, video, too, promoting – the guide service. And I showed that to one of your clients, Rick Barrow, who is also one of our customers at Jake's. And uh, we did a fishing flea market this weekend and, and he was there first one to set up for his table, but I showed him that video and I can tell you, he was tickled pink with, uh, with that and uh, good quality. Um, and he's on the very end of that, with that video and he got to laughing and uh, Rick's an old uh, veteran, uh, Vietnam veteran. And so I know he appreciates you guys um at mccotter's the guide service and taking him out and getting him on fish uh every time he comes back in the store he's always sharing pictures of of the fish that you guys have caught and uh and a lot of times i've already seen him from your posts online but uh just a little feedback there for you he, he definitely appreciates that and uh it's always good to see guys you know anybody smiling when they catch fish but then also to be able to go back and watch that and see that again so that, that's some good stuff Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad he's uh, and he speaks very highly of uh, Jake's bait and tackle as well. He's a, he's a good good customer of mine, and I'm, I'm glad we can share him. He's a, he's a lot of fun. Special needs, but definitely a good time in the boat. <laughs> right, and I, and I was telling Thomas before he came on too about the Green Top. That looks like an incredible. I've been there to their store. It's it's phenomenal. I haven't been to that event, but that seems like a a very well run event. Yeah, the amount of, uh, I think they had seven 150 foot long tents set up in their parking lot. Doc Dogs, Berkeley um, um, Fishing Experience Tank, Michael Waddell. I mean, it's really become the largest event in the mid Atlantic of its kind. And there's no better place to share the hunting and fishing traditions than, than our locally owned stores, whether it be Jake's or Green Top or Dancers or any of these locally owned stores that uh that really rely upon hunters and anglers and and their love of, of hunting and fishing so th this was a, a really great weekend to to celebrate those traditions with family and friends and i i was glad to be there and i'm glad your event uh went well too good good thinking to have that what is the flavor um when, when you talked about your youtube channel are, are you going to be trying to do the the cinematic approach is it going to be more of a vlog style is there anything that you could tease out just for the fans uh don't don't give everything away but but yeah. like when to expect content to start coming out yeah um you know thomas that's a, that's that's the big question is when when are we ready to to announce it and when are we ready to drop youtube video one and I, I don't want to put an exact date on it, but I say it will be within the next 30 days. Okay. And um, it'll be a number of things. One, you'll have the Woods and Waters Pro Tips, which will be, you know, members of the pro team. They'll, they send me 40 second clips and we, we edit them. We put a, you know, a bumper and a closer on it. You know, and then IDs, we, we have little, little set up intros and uh, in a closing set pieces, which you've already seen on one little sample video. And these are tips from the, the pro team. They're hunters, they're anglers, they're, they're, they're notable people, Aaron Ball, um, 
um, gosh, uh, Pete Wallace, uh, Kate Anstrom, Sam Scott from Blue Ridge Muskie, uh, Chris Gorsuch, which you, who you've interviewed. Um, there's there's a number of other other people. Ed Hall. Um, all these people have had years of experience, so they'll give us a quick hit, a pro tip, and then then we'll drop that. And then you'll have, and that'll be no more than two minutes. And then you'll have four length videos, which we don't really want to do anything more than 10 minutes. We just don't really feel that, you know, we're, we're not going to be asking you to eat a hot pepper and go catch three species of fish. I promise you that. <laughs> we're going to give... <laughs> We're going to give you how to, where to go, destinations, personalities, you know, with 35 years of contacts, we will, we will content mine, but the mining will be, you know, pretty, pretty easy. You know, it won't be like trying to find uh, mithril. We're going to be able to find content very, very easily. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be very diverse, varied fishing, hunting, um, you know, maybe, maybe the director of the game in inland fisheries, DWR, you know, who knows, turn around and talk to you guys about uh, what you're doing. And then guys, like always, everything will be linked in the episode description, you know, including to woods and water, their YouTube channel. Once it becomes available, we'll link all that in the episode description. You are an insanely busy man. How the heck are you being able to do all this? Like, do you surround yourself with a good team or do you just not sleep or like, how do you do this? Lots of gray hair is coming on, on, uh, <laughs> very quickly. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I sleep and uh, I have a really good team. What I've learned over the years is that you do need to surround yourself with a team because you can't do it all. You just, you, you get exhausted. And uh, I like what I'm doing. I honestly do. So if you like what you're doing, and I'm sure you've heard this time after time after time, um, it won't seem that difficult to get up and do it or you know maybe when you're tired or, or fatigued or your stem is ebbing you're like well you know what i really like this so i'm going to do it and granted there are things that i do that aren't um 100 pleasant all the time but for the most part i enjoy what i'm doing and i've chosen that path and um here i am yeah yes i am busy but so far, you know, the good Lord has granted me health and stamina. I thank him for it every day. And I continue to step in, in, in hopes that rock will be in place in front of me when I step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I 100% agree with you there. If you, if you love what you do, like you can work way past. And I think it's the biggest issue nowadays with kids getting, you know, going into college and stuff is they choose career paths that they just do not have interest in and they're not passionate about it at all. And I know there's a balance between, you know, doing something that actually provides food, but also something that if you're not passionate about it at all, you're just going to do bare minimum and the quality will go down. And I think that is so hard nowadays to tell, you know, the next generation, if you're trying to get into the industry, you got to make sure that it's something that you're willing to grind at in the beginning, because that's how you're going to become one of the top 10% in that field. Well, let's also be honest. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. And it, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. If you want to be an entrepreneurial person, wonderful. It's, it's, it's hard to teach that. It's almost like you're born with it. I have my reasons for, for being that type of person. I will say that I read a very interesting book by the um, founder of Chick-fil-A who failed a couple of times before he actually hit it big with Chick-fil-A. And he said to a lot of his people, don't sit around waiting for the perfect job. Find something that needs to be done. All right. And do it. And you will be able to make, you know, a living probably if you get good at it, because it, it's a job that needs to be done. Don't be picky. But. Find that job that needs to be done, train yourself and figure out how to do it and you will do fine. So again, not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur, nor should they. But if they want to, yeah, you gotta you gotta want it. And it's uh it's an interesting life, but it, I've enjoyed every bit of it. How much do you actually get to fish nowadays? Like I know you still guide, but then you're always up on a tank or, or doing press conferences like this one here. Like, do you still set aside some time just to fish with your family or just to relax? I tell you what, I really enjoyed fishing on the tank yesterday in the parking lot at Green Top. I probably would have had 15 <laughs> or 16 pounds had uh, the tank owner not come to me and say, stop hooking my fish. <laughs> and I said, I didn't know we weren't supposed to hook them today. Uh, you know, okay, no problem. But uh, that was a lot of fun. And, you know, I can honestly say I caught fish in Green Top's parking lot and uh, loved every minute of it. And, you know, the, the people that, that came to look at it in a light mist, they were they were clapping and excited to see it so that that was really infectious I, I love being able to you know 
in, interact with the crowd and, and and do that do that kind of stuff as far as me fishing on my own i do have time to take fishing a while back i realized that i was i was working so hard i had no memories this is 20 25 years ago except for work memories mm -hmm. okay that's not good so i decided and i talked with my wife i said we need to take and make time to make memories i know that sounds pathetic but sometimes you get caught up in everything you're trying to do and you'll work seven days a week so, you know honestly i sometimes i did i just came off of working seven days a week and i'm a deacon at my church so oh, wow. i need to i need to take a little time off on sunday to to do more um along that side of, on that part of my life but mitch and i who's my son 20 years old he's on the vision tech fishing team we planned trips last year we went to um Santee cooper oh, and cool. fished there for a spring break which was awesome i had an incredibly good time i went there 30 years ago with my father and it wasn't the greatest trip to be honest with you we were kind of at each other's throats but um we had that mitch and i had an amazing time he and i are great great buddies and good traveling companions he's very respectful and he's he's a good boy um or young man we went to ocean isle as a family for four days um i would never do that before just because i'm like in season no no vacation whatsoever but we took our carolina skiff which is an old beat up boat we bought from uh, my father-in-law fished every morning caught lots of flounder that was a lot of fun and then we went to um right before we went back to tech we went to to we stayed in manio and we fished what's called the inner banks of north carolina hmm. and that was mm -hmm. incredible hmm. nobody fishes there hardly at all ed hall w2 pro team member gave me the inside scoop where to stay where to fish and we we had so much fun for you know just two and a half days but when he comes home like he'll come home this weekend we'll fish i mean i'll guide every day this week starting tomorrow through saturday and then i'll fish with him so yes i do have time that's cool to 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 fish with my kids we're going to grouse camp um at the end of this month october 27th through beginning no, october 26th through the beginning of november we're trying to hit the grouse flight in canaan valley which we did last year perfect i have a, a two-year-old Brittany, and uh she's she's ready to go it's good stuff yeah I, I i try i'm better i noticed on um, back to the green top bass tank i noticed one of those catches was on the the new berkeley slobber knocker um, was there anything else that um, you took away, um, whether it be lures or products or anything from the Green Top show that's maybe doesn't have to be new, but anything that, that's new to you or something that's shareable to our audience? Mm, that's a good question. I was stuck in the booth for most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I just couldn't get out of it. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty much biased to Berkeley because I'm a pure fishing uh, ambassador full disclosure you know I, I, mm -hmm. I work with them and promote their products it's kind of cool to have one american company um, good products. yeah it, all, i know you saw that stuff a lot of stuff in your store it's a great company they have a whole lot of um mm -hmm. you know like swim baits things like that coming out you know your article um on the iCast products was incredibly helpful to me mm -hmm. you know it, it distills a lot of what it is that we're going to be expecting to see coming into the uh the shops mm -hmm. Um, so as far as it green top, mm -hmm. that's very hunting heavy, Jared. It's really, I mean, lots of manufacturers sure. there, you know, they're, they're Virginian, they're, they're new Benelli. That's, that's a big deal. 300 of those are made and they're going to, you know, have mm -hmm. those, that 75th anniversary gone. But as far as, um, as tackle, um, you know, this is not the, the time of year for, for new tackle, so to speak. It's just, it's, we're kind of in between new tackle sense. times. So let me, let me think a little bit right. before i make a final answer but no, no you're fine yeah I'm, I'm excited about the slobber knocker though uh you know the chatter bait the the jackhammer specifically i mean that's uh that kind of changed i think maybe not changed the fishing industry but it was a, a great new product new lure that a lot of people use so uh but the slobber knocker, like you said berkeley uh pure fishing they do a great job so uh just anxious to see how that's gonna fare um for anglers but Success. They're they're getting to uh, so many other like areas of lures, you know, hard bait. They're not just soft baits anymore. Yeah. They're 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 to they have spinner baits now. Right. They have jigs. They have you know crank baits, top orders. Mm -hmm. I mean, that surge shed, the the walker. I had a fish mm -hmm. hit a walker on the tank, which is crazy. Um, whether it was the walker or just mm -hmm. hungry fish, I don't know. But it's caught so dang many fish for me. It's just it's mind boggling. I call it the big banana, but it's mm -hmm. the Berkeley walker. It's the big three hooked. Um, right. Zero spook type of lure that they have. 
is is fall fishing catching on for the majority of anglers because i know from if you talk about the one percenters the the top pros you know usually the fall is is hunting season but when you trickle down to the grassroots and and potential people that are going to use your guide service is there an uptick now because of so much information on fall fishing Hmm. well there's an uptick in fishing period you know obviously the covid um years brought many people into the into the pursuit of, of fishing of any kind, but freshwater fishing in general. I mean, I, I can guide on Friday, guys. I, I've, I've never seen so many people mm-hmm. on the lake on a Friday. Maybe it's the same with the river, Jared, with what you're saying, but yeah, there's no more people that live here at Lake Anna. There's more people that just come down here and fish because they bought boats two years ago and waited to use them. So there's either gonna be a lot of used boats for sale in about 12 to 18 months, or there's just mm-hmm. gonna be a lot more people fishing, which mm-hmm. is a great thing either way. But uh, you know, fall fishing has always been been good for me. But you're right; we do have a do have a, a little lessening of pressure due to that. But there are more people in general fishing, I think. So yeah, fall is is very busy. You know, you have a a little break. We're we're kind of coming out of that little break with the fish fed like crazy and are fat and full. And now they're you know water temperatures dropping. They're repositioning and they're starting to get you know a little hungry again. So it's it's going to pick up nice. After by the end of this week, I'll know. <laughs> That's true. Um, another thing that I just think when you're talking specifically about like Anna, I just interviewed Matt Sell, who actually runs uh, Deep Creek Lake for the Maryland DNR department. And he talks about one of the biggest issues there is the wake boats. And, and as soon as he said that, I remember I fished a kayak tournament this summer there and I almost died because of those suckers. Is, is that becoming an issue of not just not not just fishing, but like of just safety? with that lake and how busy it's getting. Yeah, very controversial subject, Thomas. And I serve on a board as the chairman of this this Lake and Advisory Committee board that actually reviews no wake surfing buoys. And, um, you know, wake surfing people are usually pretty well healed. You know, they're buying, do you think bass boats are expensive? Oh yeah. (laughs) A wake surfing boat, you're not gonna touch one for less than $120,000 and up. So when someone buys that boat, they want to be able to use it the way they want to use it. Now, there is a very positive trend here at Lake Anna. I don't don't know. I can't speak for any other lakes. I know Smith Mountain has a lot of wake surfing on it. And I've seen in the Chickahominy River as well. Um, But I, I, I think that a lot of the wake surfing folks are realizing that, you know, things may change if they don't change some of their behaviors. So there's a movement afoot to educate. It's an education mm-hmm. movement to, it's called wake responsibly. Hmm. Now, whether that actually, you know, works, I don't know, but it includes, you know, putting up signs at boat ramps as well as um, POAs, you know, the access areas for the subdivisions around the lake that says don't make repeated passes, um, don't play your music at a you know potentially disturbing level. Um, you know, make sure you're, I can't remember whether it's 100 or 200 feet mm-hmm. from a dock. Um, I don't know whether it says anything about, you know, going near a fisherman, <laughs> I don't think it does. But, um, you know, these mm-hmm. are some common sense things that one would hope that everybody would understand, but Maybe they don't. So there's an education effort underway here at Lake Anna to to try and 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 this has been initiated by the wake surfing groups who have organized because they're pushing back. On That's good. The few no wake surfing zones that uh, have cropped up here at Lake Anna and Smith Mountain is now going through the same thing. So where we're going with that, I don't know. I would advise you as a kayak angler to be very careful because a three foot wave not only will will upset you, but if I hit a three foot wave with my boat, it's going to you know, swamp the boat. So I have to be very careful as well. And that's why I don't guide on the weekends after Memorial Day. <laughs> so Memorial to Labor Day, I don't do any weekends. But luckily now that you know we're getting down towards the winter time, boating pressure is gone. The fish are starting to fatten up. Uh, is this going to be what one of is this like one of the best times of year to get out on the water with you just to catch pure numbers? I used to say that October was the most beautiful, difficult fishing month that I could I could think of because the trees were on fire, 
the lake was turning over. Um, honestly, the fishing in August and September is fire here. That's when they're just, the fish are, you look at the, the Facebook pictures that we, we post, the fish are bloated. They're actually going to the bathroom <laughs> when you pick them up because they're so full of shad. Um, now, what happens is that the lakes, Lake Anna doesn't fully um, stratify, but some of it does. So it turns over and um, you know the bottom comes to the top, top goes to the bottom, and you get water temperature very similar throughout the entire level. So then fish disperse. And they don't have to be, you know, in a certain level where the oxygen and the bait fish are, are all good. They can be anywhere. And that, that gets a little trickier. And then it stabilizes and the fish get ravenous again. And in Lake Anna, that happens a little bit later in the year than a lot of people think. That usually coincides with the start of the winter series tournaments out of Surgeon Creek in uh, November. Usually by the beginning of November, it's fantastic. It's a little bit different on the hot side. That, um, that that tends to just be a completely different animal. But on the main lake, um, you get a lot of heavy feeding in November from bass, striper, and, uh, and wiper, and crappie. Why do you think it's delayed like it is to where it is, you know, or more around the, the Thanksgiving time that the lake actually gets stable again? Is that because of the hot side, or is it just Lake Anna and how Lake Anna has always been? Yeah. No, I think that the lake is is warm. You know, it stays warm for a long time, and and it could be two to about two to three weeks. It varies. You know, some I you know the last couple of years October has been fantastic, absolutely awesome. You've had you know multiple acre large acre wide schools of of stripers and wipers and sometimes bass on the periphery of them. Um, you know, on the surface breaking down lake, and we 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 have not had that in the past in October, you have very small, smaller outbreaks of, of fish kind of at the splits area, the splits up to the first two bridges. And uh, all those big schools down lake is because they've stocked, they've really stocked the lake hard in the last couple of years, meaning they've stocked it with more fish. So you, you have a lot of juvenile fish down there. Most of those fish aren't 20 inches, but you know, there's a few of them that are. The bigger fish will be, uh, We'll be and to your point, that. Thomas, you know, it's one thing when we first opened a bait and tackle shop to realize because I was that guy that, you know, would hunt. I would start hunting now, bow hunt, you know, all the way up through muzzleloader rifle season, you know, maybe grouse hunt in January, trout fish February. Uh, but really fishing is year round for those that aren't in the woods that want to fish. And uh, for reasons like you said, too, the, the less pressure on the lake. Now, yeah, it's going to be colder, but. Uh, get out for a couple hours midday and the fish are still going to eat. You may not catch the the sheer numbers, but uh, overall size tends to be better, you know, in the winter time. So for people that haven't been out, you know, to fish throughout uh, the winter, uh, encourage them to get out. There's safety factors and things of that nature, but uh, don't think the fishing stops or the fish stop eating just because it gets cold. But, you know, again, I just encourage people that, that haven't fished this time of year to, to get out and uh and fish fish all year round if, if you can no no 100 percent. and that's what's so, that's what's so cool about lake anna is the fact that it is 12 like months that. out of the year and i i would suggest mm -hmm. it is probably one of the best winter fisheries we have in virginia for bass um i mean i remember in college when we would go down to lake hartwell and kiwi and you pre-fish in like january february and you could have great days and you, and you go back to lake anna and maybe it's because of the shad and the blueback it's insane how good that place can be in November and December and January. Um, it, it really is a gym. Yeah, I think you're right. The, uh, the herring are much more cold water hardy than the thread thins. So they, they add a, an extra element to winter fishing at the lake, you know? So yeah, I think you're on the right track there. Thread fin and, and herring equal Good and then with Odenkirk, you know, at. like we had him on the show and he talked about, you know, the F1s being put in there. I, do you think we're we're going to see a, a, a 25, a 30 pound sack, 25, 30 pound sack come out of there pretty routinely in the next five ish years, six ish years? Yeah. 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 We're, we're, yeah. A 25 pound bag is is somewhat routine now. Yeah. Um, there was this tournament where you weighed in one big bass every hour last year in the winter. I think it was like March. And it was that, it was that day that it snowed. Mitch and I were coming back from uh, Santee Cooper that day, and we drove through the snowstorm here. So that was the first week of March. And those guys, while you don't have a limit because you're weighing in a fish every hour, they weighed in five fish 
I don't think any of them are smaller than five pounds, and some mm. of them are over six. So there's just this is before much. the F ones really get in there. Yeah. Too. Wow! In March, there's yeah. the winter. Thomas, uh, last time the F ones now, Thomas. I'll oh, go for it. No, go. For it. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the F ones now. Um, I think we're catching them 14 to 15 inches. They've been there two years now. And we're catching this fish that's really robust. It's vigorous. And that's actually a scientific term for, for its health. And um, I asked John Odenkirk, who's the biologist for, for, for the region and is in his region, could, could a 14 inch fish be one of the, uh, the F1 hybrids? He goes, it could, yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, we're catching these fish that, that they're they're a lot fatter and more vigorous and more aggressive. And, you know, I asked him about well, will those genes, um, I don't know what the word is, you know, intersperse as those fish, you know, breed with regular fish. And he goes, no, uh, a, a hybrid. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's just a one gener. It's a one off. Once that mm -hmm. generation is bred, they do not pass on any type of genes to the uh, the off, any any of the vigorous genes to the offspring so when they stock those that's it they don't mm. they don't change the the population so it really just population. helps supplement basically the brood that you already have in there and i and i guess this can also be seen with james river and you have all these tournaments where they do have it's just insane that they're always pulling out a, a six pounder out of there every tournament it's just stupid and again you know that goes back to one of the things that we're going to eventually talk about here which is the james river stocking that pretty much started virginia's obsession with with big fish and trying to make sure all the all the uh estuaries in this state can produce insanely big fish but there's something unique about like anna that you know when we're talking to odenkirk it is so damn fertile like you take you know live you know your live scope or any sonar and you go through there and it will cloud with bait why is it lake anna can just be acres upon acres of bait i mean in, in your opinion why is that the case It's small. Lake Anna is small. You're only fishing 9,700 public acres. So it's overrun. Most of the time, what you're talking about is thread thin. Every now and then you'll see gizzard shad, but uh, most of the time you see those clouds of bay fish, it's thread thin. And occasionally it could be, could be herring, but mostly it's dike three where you see the huge schools of herring. So yeah, it's just small. You, you're going to be able to see, like if you go into, I mean, you were just mentioning a couple of those lakes on the Savannah River, like Clark Hill slash Strom Thurmond or Coney. Those are pretty big lakes. And, you know, granted, I, I'm sure you're gonna, you can see some large concentrations of herring or threadfin down there, too. But, I mean, one of those lakes is 70,000 acres or, you know, and is tiny. And uh, that's probably why you're seeing so many bait, bait fish concentrated in small areas. You know, and by the, going back to the F1s. I think one of the reasons why my my John finally relented and, and and put those in the lake is because we were saying, John, please, why are we not catching a 10 pound bass mm -hmm. out of Lake Anna? Come on. I mean, what's the problem? It's got to be genetics. Our genetics are, you know, not producing big fish. I mean, we have a long growing season. We probably have enough cover. Fishing pressure. Yeah. But I mean, people aren't keeping them mm -hmm. for the most part. And um uh, so I think that one of the reasons that F1s are stocked more than to supplement a population in a lake, maybe more to supplement a population in a tidal river, but in a lake, it's to grow a larger fish. And DWR will tell you, we do not manage for mm -hmm. big fish. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they do it briery. So, I mean, it's great to, great to have somebody like a professional like John, able, you're able to communicate with him and he listens to anglers. And he works hard and and really does a good job. And Anna is a very good example of that. We will see ten pound bass, many more ten pound bass, I think, in Lake Anna in four to five years. Is is this change on the DNR stocking F one? Can this really be looking back at what happened on the James River through private stocking? Is that really the case study that you could point to and say to them, "Hey, it worked here." Here's an article called the Chickahominy River Experiment. It's dated 2007. It was precedent setting. He was ready. So, for <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you got to be ready, man. A guy like you, just sharp. You want to be ready for that question. Um, 
Yeah, it, you know, looking back at that time, it was really interesting. I, I still remember going to that that angler meeting at the DWR at that time, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries meeting room, and there was about 150 ma- angry anglers. Wow. <laughs> the chicken company was coming off of a drought. Fishing was, if you can imagine, horrible. I mean, you could fish all day and catch like five 12 inch bass, maybe on a duck blind. And, you know, because the drought had killed most of the SAV, the submerged aquatic mm-hmm. vegetation. Uh, as well as blighted some of the lily pads in the upper region. So there, it really wasn't good. And um, right about when the drought broke, this all went down. So the natural reproduction was starting to catch back up. But this was, this was almost like a mob. And, you know, your, your, your game and fisheries guys are sitting up in the front. We're all in the back. And Bruce Lee, he would be a guy that you guys should talk to. He is, he's, he, I am nothing compared to Bruce Lee. That man is a self-made, you know, well-off man, and he has helped us as anglers immensely. He was the one who spearheaded hmm. the Concerned Bass Anglers of Virginia, which was the group that, that as you referred to, raised um, about seventy-five thousand dollars to start the stocking program, and. Some of that money was his own. I think Wu Dave's got money um, from Johnny Morris. So it's a it's a really good story. My phone's going to run out of battery, so we may have to do a, a, a second installment at some point. But it's it's amazing how that meeting led to the Game Commission digging in their heels and saying, under no circumstances are we going to put stock bass in a tidal river. That's ludicrous. I mean. I think we went to one of the highest people in the game commission and he, I, I mean, you could have smoke coming out of your ears. He would have had it coming out of his ears. And so would Bruce Lee and some of the other anglers. It was, it was rough. And, you know, and what year was this? And, what year was this again? That was in 2004 because the first, first fish went in the, in the river in 2005. I, uh, I remember being on the stocking boat in that one and the first year didn't go that well because you know we got the fish we <laughs> we raised money by having a casino night uh at a, at a golf course i don't know it's kind of defunct it's right over there on the uh on the james after the after the i think it's the 155 bridge going to hopewell we had a great night we raised a lot of money and then we had other donations um and we got the fish and like I said, Game Commission was mad. They did not want to do it. They didn't want to waste any time. They knew better than we did, but they had angry constituents. So they had to respond. And uh, they did. And the first year was kind of, you know, piecemeal. We had these big tubs and the stocking truck rolled into, uh, at the time it was called Chickahominy Riverfront Park, down there Route, route 5 mm-hmm. um, at the mouth of James. And we put, I think like 15,000 fingerling bass in every tub, beautiful sight. But we did it in July, in the morning in July. And, you know, the water was like 90 degrees. So we each had a map, you know, and we, we looked at the map and we went out to our assigned stocking location. I can't remember where I was, some creek. I don't know where it was, maybe like Yarmouth or something. And uh, we dumped all our fish in, you know, using, a, well, we used a net. We scooped them out. I'm telling you what, when we put those fish in, in my mind, the further you were away from the, the ramp, the longer those fish had to be in that tub mm-hmm. and the less they fared well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so by the time we dipped our fish in, into the river, our fingerlings, some of them were not swimming away very strongly. And it, it, the amount of crabs that came up and started eating those little baby bass was heartbreaking. Um, so the next year when, when there's a guy by the name of Bob Greenlee, who was the biologist for down there, I'm not sure whether he's with game commission anymore, but he's a very good scientist and, he spent a lot of time surveying after that initial stocking in 2006. He uh, he surveyed, and only 19% of the fish that he surveyed through electroshocking were from the stocking. So obviously there was some mortality, but some live, and you never know how accurate that is. The next year he surveyed because we did it three years in a row. Uh, it was over 80% of the fish that he served, that he collected. And, and you have to crack the fish's ear bones to, to see. There's a, a tetracycline 
process where they they dye the fish. The only way you can tell it's a stocked fish is if you crack the ear bones and and note under a microscope if it has te tetracycline staining. Um, anyway, over 80% of the fish they collected were uh, stocked fish. So, you know, the angels sang and everybody was happy. And the game commission said, maybe we were wrong. And the next year, they contributed a lot of the money to get the stock fish. And we had oxygen infusers in the tanks. Um, there were no nets used. There was these like, they had these tubes that shot the fish into the tanks. I mean, it was, in fact, they did all the stocking. The anglers never even touched the fish, which was even better. So after those three years, we all know what happened. The Chickahominy fishing just was unreal. And it continues to be good because they also stocked uh, they did a three-year run in 2017 to 19. And I, I went on one of the boats with the then director, Bob Duncan, and we put fish in, um, in Morris Creek. And that was, that was a great effort too, because this, the initial stocking was held up nationwide. You know, Bob Greenlee wrote these papers and Aaron Bunch, the bass, largemouth bass leader in, um, for the DWR, they got national recognition for this. And I'm, I'm happy to say that Bruce Lee was right. He was very stubborn, very determined, and he would never take no for an answer. And Wu Days was very, very helpful with that, as well as Bass Pro Shops. They, they paid for a large amount of the stockings in the beginning through donations. Well, we also need to, so you that, need to take a bow too, um, for what you did to help out with this as well. Cause I think we're still seeing the effects positively, not just on the James, but I think throughout other fisheries in Virginia, because people took a chance and said, we think this will help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said before too, Thomas, you've talked about how it's, it's two or three fold too. And you have the state, like, you know, you're saying, and, uh, same thing happened at Smith Mountain Lake, I think, where you know, the state, like you said, is always going to take that stance. We, we don't want to introduce, you know, fish or wildlife into what's natural. Um, but same sort of thing happened to my knowledge that, you know, a private funder decided, you know, let's we're going to do it and I'm going to pay for it. Um, and then and then from that now has opened up to Lake Anna and many other fisheries. Uh, to do that, but I still hear the same thing up here. When we, we privately talked about doing it, like like holiday, um, and it's not just the state. Um, some of the hatchery guys are the same way. They don't, they don't. But I agree with you on the idea of that genetic strain, and it's it's going to get bigger. And if you don't have that, the genetics. I mean, you could have the food, you could have the bass, you give it the age, and it's going to get up there close, but it may not get over you know that ten pound mark. Um, so it is, it is very interesting, um, to see how these things can come to light as a joint effort. hundred percent, hundred percent. Uh, Chris, I know your phone might be dying here any second. So, uh, just not, so we lose you, uh, wh where can people find you? What, what do people need to know that you got coming up besides the YouTube channel? You're going to be at the Richmond Expo, correct? I will. Yep. We'll have a, uh, at least one booth there for Woods and Waters, and then perhaps with the guide service as well. The the associate guides will come in and help with that. Um, who knows? We might bring some kayaks, you know, with Lake and Outfitters. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you can you can obviously. I'm kind of an old school guy. I'm, I'm more uh, more Facebook than anything else. But uh, there is a Woods and Waters Instagram page. Um, you can always just shoot me an email if somebody wants to, to go fishing at uh, mickfish9144 at gmail.com. And then the magazine uh, email is woodsandwatersmagazine at gmail.com. I did want to say that there was a very um, little known effort to restock the title Rappahannock. And maybe, maybe if you'll have me back, we can talk about that next time and maybe even get Bruce Lee to uh, to join us. I don't know whether you can do a, a four-way, but he... Um, he did the same thing in the Rappahannock and the results of that were, were very interesting and certainly a story worth telling.
Yeah, absolutely. We could definitely get a couple extra people on here with you. Uh, that, that'd be a fun story to hear, too, because it I, I really think it doesn't just come down to us complaining about the government or, or whether no matter what people's opinions are of the DNR, the human beings are doing their best. But I think it's going to take private efforts by all of us as anglers to really make sure that we maximize our waters and we take care of them, not just to lean on them and tell them they need to do better. And whether that is, guys, you pick up trash around the boat ramps or we do some kind of private stocking again in the future, you know, we need to we need to husband our resources as well and take responsibility for that um, but again guys you know please in the episode description everything will be linked for woods and water so you can be able to find this and then we get to see the unveiling of this really cool uh, youtube channel series that i'm super excited to watch you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will